So this act of <clears throat> of developing samadhi, of making our minds firm and stable, it's something that we're able to develop uh, throughout the entire day. Even if we have duties and work to do uh, during the day, um, we can still develop our samadhi and we can still have mindfulness while doing that. This mindfulness looking after our hearts. And that's uh, something important to do for us to constantly be looking at our minds to see what state they're in. As the Buddha said, those who look after their minds are the ones who will escape from Mara's trap. And this means escaping from suffering. So whether we're standing, sitting, walking, lying down, we always try and have mindfulness there. So this mindfulness is the quality of recollection and Sampajanya is an all-round knowing. We try to keep this with us uh, in a continuous way, evenly. When we have mindfulness and that's firm, then it will be easy for samadhi to arise and for that to be well established. And within the state of samadhi, there is mindfulness there. And within mindfulness, there is samadhi. But it just depends on which has the more strength, whether the samadhi is stronger or whether mindfulness has more energy. Um, But it depends on both of these, uh, the energy of both uh, mindfulness and wisdom in order for, uh, sorry, mindfulness and samadhi in order for wisdom uh, to arise. But if uh, samadhi is very strong, but the mindfulness is very weak, then the mind will only be interested in stillness and in peace. Um, There won't be all that much uh, stability there, and there won't be much energy for wisdom to come up. So we need to try to develop this and to to not be heedless. We can bring up the recollection of the Buddha as the object of our mind in order to uh, stabilize our minds and to uh, make samadhi strong. And this will allow sama samadhi, right concentration, to arise. From this state, there's great rapture and a fullness of heart. And this comes through recollecting the goodness of the Buddha. Now, his wisdom that he was able to uh, completely destroy the defilements and was able to get rid of uh, ignorance, of each other, And no one else could do this through their own efforts. And so he was the uh, Samasam Buddha, perfectly self-awakened Buddha. And when he went to teach, what he emphasized was um, being heedful. And just before his uh, passing into Fauna Nibbana, this is the teaching that he gave. And he had compassion to give this uh, last teaching. And for us all to train our minds and to not be heedless. And then after giving this teaching, the Buddha uh, went into the uh, formless jhanas. And Venerable Anuruddha was able to uh, follow his mind as he passed through these various states of absorption. He knew where his mind was until the Buddha passed into Phala Nibbana. So he taught us to not be heedless, to perfect ourselves in heedfulness, to get to know the Sankharas, whether they're the conditions of our body and mind, to see that they are of the nature to change, that they're unstable. When they've already arisen, then they'll stay for a short period and then they'll pass away. And we're not able to find anything there that's stable, anything that's dependable. So in a hundred years from now, then there won't, all of the people who are alive 
will have died already. And the many billions of people who are on this planet, they'll all have passed away. And all of the animals who are currently on this planet, in a hundred years, they will be gone as well. Each day passes by very quickly. And for those of us who are over 30 years old, if we look back to our lives when we were a child, to that time in childhood, then we feel like it's gone by in a flash. And likewise, for those who are 40 years old, you look back and the time has passed so quickly. And those who are 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, when we look back over our lives, then it's just, it's gone by so quickly. And things flash past. So as each day goes past you know, in a very fast manner, we should try to train our minds to develop our, our mindfulness until it reaches a state of fullness. Because it's the nature of the mind to chase after every experience that it, it uh, comes into contact with. And this is the food of the heart, these various aramanas, these mental experiences. And our heart likes all of them. It's fascinated by all of them. And so it gets lost in them, deluded by them very easily. If there's a feeling of hate, then uh, the mind will easily grab onto that and become uh, a hateful mind. If there's an aramana, that uh, is the basis for fear, then the mind will become very scared. If there's an aramana that's the basis for love, then the mind will uh, start loving. We can compare the mind to being like clear water. And all of the things that it experiences are like dyes that are put into the water, different colors put in. So like if we put... Uh, love into this clear water, then the water turns pink. And every different emotion has a different color to it. You know, hate has one color, delusion has another color. You know, some are green, some are black, some are off-white. And whatever color that's put in, then the water will take that and become that color as well. And so it gets dyed in this way. But if we can separate those out, if the color gets separated out from the water, then it becomes pure, just like it was before. And so it is with the mind that when it attaches to these emotions, then it will be stained by those emotions. But when we can take the emotions out and we can separate it out, then the mind goes back to its original pure state. The thing is that these emotions, they come up uh, very clear, quickly. And all the things that the mind experiences, they, they happen uh, very fast. And so all of the things that come in through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, our minds, you know, they, they come in quick succession. And so it's difficult for us to see the purity of the mind because it's always involved in these things. Therefore, we need to try to train our mindfulness to become quicker, to become better, through controlling our minds and not allowing them to go and attach to the various things that they experience. We can then separate out the water from these dyes and see that they are two separate things. Whenever we notice that our mind has been stained by a particular emotion, then we should try to take that out as quickly as possible to bring the mind back to its pure state as fast as we can. Like Venerable Subhata, who was able to contemplate into this uh, very nature as well, that on the, the full moon day of the sixth lunar month, just before the Buddha's final Nibbana. He had developed incredibly strong mindfulness and this stable samadhi. 
and his mind was exceptionally clear. All it took was for him to just see you know, this this flash of uh, uh, experience in the mind and how that turned his mind murky. And just seeing that, he was able to attain to the Dhamma. But for us, we look at our minds all day long. You know, we've been observing them for a very long time now. And we've uh, looked at the moon Many, many times we've seen many clouds pass in front of the moon. And in one year we observe this hundreds of times, but we haven't seen into the Dhamma. And the reason that we haven't seen into it is because our our stability of mind isn't good enough. Our samadhi isn't strong enough. And so wisdom then can't arise. So if... uh, or when our mind does start becoming stable to some degree, then we'll be able to see into truth to that degree. And it just depends on the amount of peace that we have in our hearts. So whichever kamatana, whichever object of meditation we use to bring about peace, then we use that and we will then see clearly. We'll understand that in order to develop this path of practice, we do need peace of mind. And the mind does uh, uh, need uh, stability and stillness. And then from that, uh, wisdom can develop. We will be able to see into conventions, into samuti. And through that, the mind will uh, realize vimuti, liberation. The heart becomes empty and pure at that time. We'll see that all physicality and mentality is not self, is anatta. And this is one means uh, for attaining to the Dhamma. We'll then be able to contemplate into the body in a very refined manner, which will in turn make the heart even more still. So at the beginning, it's important to try to always have this uh, sincerity in the practice, trying to have our mindfulness there throughout the entire day. Always be watching over our minds and not letting them uh, run about all over the place. Because if they go off and play with this thing and play with that thing, then when we pull them back, they'll be all out of energy and our mindfulness just won't be there. If throughout the day we've allowed them to get involved into liking and disliking very often, then it'll be difficult when evening comes around and we sit in meditation to bring the heart into a state of peace. So we need to have this integrity and the sincerity to be trying to not allow our minds get involved in anger, get involved in ill will we can make the determination that we won't allow our minds to get involved in these things, to not become greedy, to not become deluded. Because life is not sure, but death is sure. So why would we want to spend our time being deluded? It's better that before we die, we work to gain true knowledge. So uh, collecting our body, speech, and mind, being restrained in body, speech, and mind is something that's of uh, great significance. And especially for the monks, because we have this opportunity and we have the time to do this. And the reason that we have gained this opportunity is because the Buddha uh, spent so much effort developing his paramitas. He had the compassion and kindness to teach us and to lay down the vinaya. The lay people have the faith uh, to come and offer us the four requisites that we need. And so everything is ready. What's left is for us to work at abandoning the defilements, to be restrained in our eyes, restrained uh, in our ears, our nose, our our mouth, our bodies, our minds, 
Now restrain these things a lot. To not let the mind go off and get involved in liking, disliking. And this is the path that will take us to knowing the Dhamma, to seeing the Dhamma. Dhamma. And it's right here. We don't have to go and look for it anywhere else. So whether we're meditating or whether we're engaging in work, if we're sweeping or going on arms round, then we have that restraint and we have that uh, intention to always be uh, keeping our minds in a good state and to be contemplating. We can contemplate the things that we see. So if we see a green leaf on the ground, then we can use that as food for investigation. Now, there are many different colors of leaves that fall. Some are green, some are orange, some are brown. We can use this and contemplate that and bring that back to recollect that the lives of people are the same. Some people die when they're old. Some people die when they're young. Some people die when they're babies. And so when a storm passes, passes through, then it's natural for some green leaves to fall and some brown leaves to fall. And our lives are just the same. They're not sure. So the Buddha taught us to not be heedless, to always be investigating within our minds and to have mindfulness with us all the time. So when we work, then we can do this. We can contemplate into the Dharma as we work. For example, we are working on a car that's broken down. We then investigate that our bodies are just the same. Our bodies are of the nature to break down just like this. So all things can be used as uh, food for Dharma to arise in the heart. What it takes is for us to have mindfulness here and nowhere else. The practice isn't anywhere else. We're always looking after our hearts, taking care of them. Uh, no matter what we're doing, whether we're meditating or working. And this is the most immediate work of a monk, to be looking after the heart. So when we ordained, uh, our preceptor gave us the meditation objects of hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. And these are the five things which wrap the body. So we can just pick up one of those and contemplate that. See it as just elements, or if we prefer, we can look at it as being not beautiful, as being loathsome. If our minds are well established, then when we look into it as being the earth element, then we'll be able to see that element break down and decay. And the uh, perception of impermanence, of instability, will arise very quickly. So therefore, it's important to uh, bring about peacefulness in our hearts. And when we've done this, then uh, the edification of the heart, teaching our minds, is very easy. All it would take is for us to just tell our minds that you know, these bodies, they're, they're anicca, they're unstable. And our minds will just believe this. They'll be able to accept it. We can tell our minds that these bodies are painful, they're stressful, they're not self. And our minds will accept that. They'll see that that is the truth, that's the way things are, if the mind is peaceful. But with this practice, we do need to have forbearance, endurance. And always be trying to follow the correct path of practice as well. This path that the awakened teachers have laid out for us. But if we walk this path, this, this way of sila, samadhi, and panya, then that will give rise to a clear seeing in us. And we'll be able to alleviate the doubts and the uncertainties that we have. When these doubts are eased, then the mind will feel very uh, confident and stable. But when it's not there, then we can often um, ask ourselves or we can wonder, you know, is this really the path that leads to Marga and Pala, to Nibbana? We may have had insights into it already, you know, seeing the world as just being uh, anatta. The whole thing is not self. But then 
uh, these doubts start coming back again. But when the mind is peaceful, then we'll feel very confident as well. We'll, listening, we'll listen to the teachings of the awakened uh, masters, and they'll teach us that uh, not allowing the mind to go for liking or disliking, this is the way to seeing the Dharma for sure. And just by listening to that, we'll have complete confidence, 100% certainty in what they're saying, that this is the way to attaining to the Dhamma. And this is important to, to have confidence in these teachings. So when we have that faith, we should put an effort into bringing our minds to a state of peace. We can recollect death and use that to still the mind, to quieten the mind. Or if we prefer, we can contemplate the body as a suba. That's fine as well. Or we can keep up the meditation mantra of Buddha and do that a lot to bring the mind to stillness. And all of these are the correct way to practice. So don't have doubts about it because this is the way to attaining it just depends on how much peace that we have in our minds. When we gain this peace, then our minds will be able to gain freedom from the moods and emotions that they experience. And we'll have this puru, the um, awakened knowing, taking care of our minds all the time. So keeping up the practice all throughout the day is very important because that's what occupies most of our time. In the morning and the evening, then we sit down and do our meditation and chanting practice, and that's important to do, but that's just a minority of our time that we spend doing that. So all throughout the day, we uh, keep track of our minds. We have our mindfulness there looking at our hearts, knowing what's going on. And we try to... uh, let the periods where mindfulness has slipped uh, be as few and far between as possible. And it's natural that that will happen. The mind will slip off. Our mindfulness will leave us. But we try to bring it back as fast as we can and make those periods uh, as few as possible. But this does require us to train our minds. Because if we don't do that, then they'll just run after everything that they experience and our lives will become chaotic. If we develop this path, then it'll become better. We'll become more skilled at it a little at a time. And in the end, our minds will be very firm and we'll be able to separate out our minds and the objects of the mind. Liberation will then be experienced by us and all of our doubts will be removed. So this does require effort though for us to be sincere in this path of practice. We may have studied the scriptures a lot already, but when we're practicing, we just put that all aside for now. All of the issues, all of the things that we're thinking about We put that all to the side and just focus on training our mind here and now. We try and let go of um, all of the issues that we have and allow our minds to settle into stillness. To train ourselves on this noble path, the path that will take us to seeing the Dhamma. In doing this, we're following the teachings of the Buddha. And when we follow it, then uh, we'll see the results for ourselves. And in this very life, if, if we sincerely follow this path, then we'll have to see into the Dhamma. So I ask for all of you to know the Dhamma and to see the truth.